So, welcome to uh, this new lesson. And today for me it's a bit emotional because it's about my own region. It's about Piemonte. And uh, it touches my heart because uh, talking about my region or one's own region is never easy. But especially in this case, a region that not only it's complex in terms of uh, wine production, but it's complex also in terms of culture and history. Therefore, before going to what is important for us, uh, wine production, I want to, to introduce something uh, to you about my culture and why this region is a bit different and it's the region that is osmotic in Europe in the sense that it's a bridge between Italy and France, if we see it in a cultural way. I want to show you right now why. So, if we start on the point of view of history, this is exactly the area where I come from. The, the, the provinces that you see in red are exactly where I come from. And these are the, the initial part of the county of Savoy. We are in Vienna, we all in Austria, we are in Krems, and we, are, we know that uh, uh, if there is a figure that is important for uh, Austrian history, is uh, Prince Eugène or Principe Eugenio, Prince Eugène from Savoy Carignan. The family was uh, originary uh, from Maurienne and Susatal, the, the valley of Susa, but by the time the capital of this Duchy of Savoy was Turin. So Turin today is in Italy, was the first capital of Italy, but before Turin and Piemonte becoming a part of Italy, they were part and head of a state, it was the state of Savoy, and this state of Savoy basically at the height of its expansion in the 15th century was comprising a, part, uh, a consistent part of Switzerland, of Valais, of Neuchâtel, a consistent part of southeastern France, uh, Savoy, Reims, Buget, and of course, Aosta Valley, Piemont, and Nizza. So what happens here? It happens that we had a culture that was neither properly French nor properly Italian. Uh, but where the two, three, four main cultures around Mont Blanc were mixing up. And at the same time, not only the cultures were mixing up, but also geographically, people were moving within these boundaries of the same state. So the frontiers were not the frontiers that we see today uh, on the Alps. Actually, both sides of the Alps were detained by the House of Savoy for a simple strategic region, reason. Uh, in the Middle Ages, if you control the Alpine passes, you control the, uh, uh, the passage of people, the passage of armies, and then anyone had to ask you, for, you could, the house uh, controlling the passes could ask for a fee for passing the pass on the other side. So it was like a modern toll system that we have in the motorways. This is the way like families like Savoy family or the Habsburg dynasty became rich in the uh, Middle Ages by simply asking fee to people for passing on the other side. Uh, of course, then, with, with the time, things have changed and uh, royal houses were fighting against each other. In this specific case, the House of Savoy was mainly always fighting with the French houses and specifically in the, uh, after Renaissance with the House of Bourbon in France. So, the, this is, as I told you before, the, uh, the Duchy of Savoy at uh, the highest, uh, the height of its extent. But uh, as you can see, also an important thing that created a different mentality. Piemont was part of the, uh, the Holy uh, uh, Roman Empire of German nations. So the, uh, today, of course, it's Italy and uh, we share in some ways, Italian mentality. But six, seven centuries, part of, a, of another world, created also another kind of mentality. So these regions like Piemont, Alsace, uh, Flandern, Catalonia, are, um, are really European uh, regions because they have a mix of cultures. They are osmotic and they are a bridge between several cultures. 
So in the 17th, in the 18th century, as you can see, now finally the capital is in Turin. Uh, the Duchess of Savoy has less interest in France because the expansion of the, the French kingdom, especially during Louis XIV uh, and Henry IV, uh, eroded some part of the, the duchy itself. But still, the, uh, uh, the duchy of Piemont uh, Savoy and then the kingdom of Sardinia was more looking to the west than to the east. And the main reason was cultural, because people, farmers also, and literate people, you have to think that by the time, not, almost nobody was going to school. The public schooling system was not existing yet, but there were local languages. And the main local languages were mainly francophone languages. If you think that, for instance, the, uh, the grandparents of Cezanne were coming from Piemont, but were not speaking in Italian. They were speaking in a Francophone language before they moved to Provence. Also the same thing for Fernandel, or for Jean-Paul Belmondo, or, uh, so, or for Jean Genot. Many famous French people from uh, Provence uh, were also coming from Piemont, but not because they moved just for uh, strange reasons. They moved there because it was the same culture. And that happens also with, uh, with grapes. Grape varieties that we find in Piemont, we can also find them in, uh, in, in Provence. Uh, we can also find them in Savoy. There are many uh, famous Swiss grapes like Petit Tardine that you can also find in Aosta Valley, which physically is part of Piemont, not administratively, but physically, geographically, is the same place. So what are we having here? We have in here a uh, uh, region that for several centuries was, was a part or was a head of a, a country of its own and then after the, uh, the French Revolution and after the Napoleon uh, domination was the start point of the creation of unification of Italy. But there was uh, a very famous professor at the University of Paris in uh, political sciences that said one time that although Piemont created Italy, possibly it was the region that was in some ways less Italian that created Italy. But still, what we, what we have here is a total evolution from a very small country, so the country around uh, the, uh, the Duchy of Savoy, composed by what we today consider different countries, to a bigger and larger country that we know today as Italy. Italy is composed by, uh, for, by 20 regions and Piemont is the second largest region in, uh, in terms of uh, geographical extension. And what is very important about Piemont is its geography. So the geography is something that it's, it makes me all the time smile because uh, when I, uh, we talk about Italy, the first thing that we, that we have in our mind is see. It's hills, it's not mountains, but actually uh, uh, all the Alpine Arc, the southern part of the Alpine Arc is in Italy, starting from Liguria, passing from Piemonte, Valley, Lombardy, uh, Trentino Alto Adige, and Friuli. So it's pretty long, but what we have in Piemonte, we have a region that 43% of it is mountains, 26% uh, is flatland, and 30% are hills. What we have to focus on specifically today are the hill, hills part, which is the, the best area for generally making wine. But what is dramatic in differences in Piemont is the attitude. So we go for, from 4,618 meters, the second highest peak in the Monte Rosa Gruppe. It's called the Grenzkipfer because that area is populated by Alemannic. Uh, people speaking still speaking Walser, so uh, Alt Alemannisch. This is Alt, Old German. This is, an, again, another example of a region that was osmotic, where, where I come from, we are bilingually French and local uh, Francophone languages. The other valleys are Occitan languages, and we have also a German speaking community in Piemonte around the Mont Blanc area. And the lowest point in Piemonte is 76 uh, meters. So you see that we have a difference in elevation of 4,500 meters. It's uh, not many regions in the world has such geographical difference. And we go from the influence of northern winds, 
uh, in the northern part of Piemonte, close to the, the, uh, to the Swiss border, to the influence of Mediterranean winds in the southern part of Piemonte. So you also, on this point of view, you can imagine in the, vitic uh, in the viticultural landscape how different this region, uh, region can be. And the total surface is 25,000 square meters and vineyards are 46,000 square meters. If you compare it with Austria, is Piemonte itself, it's, uh, it has the same extension in terms of vineyards in 2019. This is, for instance, uh, an example what you see from in vineyards in Alto Piemonte, 241 meters. In the background, you have the Monte Rosa, which is 4,634 meters. So imagine, you have very, uh, very hot summers, but still in the night, you can have a very, very fresh winds coming from the mountain. So this is, uh, this creates a landscape, that, a very rich, uh, important landscape for uh, viticulture. But this is exactly what I was telling before. We are going from 4,600 meters to the flat land. Flat land in which, thanks to the, uh, to the quantity of water that is coming from the Alpine Arc, we can also uh, cultivate rice. The risotto that we all do, and the risotto rice that we all call Arborio, Carnaroli, and so on, there are many coming from the uh, provinces of Vercelli, and Novara, located in Piemonte, or also Alessandria. But let's go now into the details of wine production. So we have a grape in Piemonte that is possibly the most famous uh, grape in Piemonte itself, possibly in Italy for red grapes, and by far considered by many uh, uh, important uh, wine experts in the world together with Pinot Noir, the best uh, red grape variety, of course, for red wines, Nebbiolo. One uh, hint that I want to give you, Nebbiolo, of course, uh, is a grape, that, but then we have several clones, and there are about six clones that are used. The most important ones are Lampia, Miquet, Rosé, uh, and Picotendro, uh, that are used in, uh, and Spanna, that are used in Piemonte, and then we have the Chiave Nasca that is used in Lombardy in Valtellina. But why also name Lombardy? Because as we can see, Lombardy is the third largest region for cultivation of Nebbiolo in, uh, in Italy. But by far the most important is Piemonte. And, uh, and as you can see, uh, we care about this great variety a lot because the majority of its plantation is uh, above 10 years old. We know, we already said some time ago, that the vines express themselves better when they are older, and especially in the case of Neviolo, it is very much so. Which are the main grape varieties that we have in Italy? This is the list. Let's focus on the ones that we have in Piemonte. As you can see, Barbera is the 10th most cultivated uh, grape variety in, in Italy, but still uh, between 1990 and 2016, there was a substantial reduction of its production so, uh, and the cultivation, uh, minus 32,000 hectares. What has not changed a lot is Muscat Blanc à Petit Grain. Wow, it's a French name for Moscato di Canelli, the, the famous Moscato Bianco that is used for making Asti Spumante or Moscato d'Aste. And then we have the 20th largest cultivated uh, grape variety in Italy that saw a substantial increase is Nebbiolo. And we go back to uh, Moscato d'Asti. Uh, this is the list of the uh, most important uh, uh, mm, protected denomination of origin that are produced in Italy. And as you can see, Moscato d'Asti and Asti are representing one of the most important and most produced uh, uh, PDO in Italy. And then we have the PDO Piemonte, which is a generic one, and then we have Barbera d'Asti. There are several Barberas, one of the most important in terms of uh, production is Barbera d'Asti. And here we have the main grape varieties in Piemonte. Wow, that's a long list. So this is something that I want to tell you. Um, um, we have countries in the world, whole countries, that have 
uh, less grape varieties than Piemonte. Piemonte has a huge uh, biodiversity. This is, this is very important. This is something that makes the region extremely rich in terms of viticulture. Although in the last years the increase in the production of Nebbiolo was very important to, due to the strong demand in the world of Nebbiolo wines, specifically in Barolo and Barbaresco, but approximately in Piemonte itself there are about 80 grape varieties of which 50 indigenous grape varieties and the list is not exhaustive because studies are undergoing in order to find other grape varieties and myself last week I uh, was in Piemonte visiting a new winemaker and I found new, two new grape varieties and how is it possible to find new grape varieties? Simple, you go in abandoned uh, vineyards, vineyards that were possibly 100 years old, 120 years old in villages where people are not anymore and you make a DNA study and you possibly find a grape variety that was maybe uh, important 100 years ago, 120 years ago, where, when people were living in small villages or in small huts in the mountains and uh, where people are not living anymore. This creates a landscape that could be potentially even richer than what it is. This is also something that it's very important. What is Piemonte doing? Possibly Piemonte is reducing its uh, vineyard surface in order to produce uh, even more qualitative wines. We know perfectly that the wine industry is mainly divided in mass production and luxury production or super premium production and the transition to super premium luxury in Piemonte is its effect. Uh, it, it has always been uh, uh, renowned as a region of highly qualitative wines. It's going more and more in this direction. This is the top 25 uh, wine production, uh, wine region, PDO wine regions in Italy. As you can see, again, the importance of Asti, Asti Spumante and Moscato d'Asti. And this is what we have in Italy. The denomination, the wine classification is basically DOCG. DOC is both they are PDO, EGT, which is PGI, and Vino Tavolo table wines. That follows in Piemonte. Piemonte is very rich in DOCG is possibly, it is for sure, the, uh, the, uh, the region richest in DOCG and DOC wines, so in uh, PDO wines in Italy. It has zero PGI, zero. But what also makes Piemonte very rich in the viticultural terms is the diversity of regions. We go, as I said before, to regions that are closer to the, uh, to the Swiss border, Two regions that are close to Liguria, hence close to the uh, uh, to the uh, Ligurian Sea. As we talked about Nebbiolo before, Nebbiolo it's mainly located in these subregions, so it's located in Lange and Roero, in Asti, in Canavese, which is in the province of Turin, in North Piemonte, which is in the province of Vercelli in the province of uh, Novara and the, provinces, uh, the province of Verbagno Cusio Ossola and outside of Piemonte in Aosta Valley which is physically, uh, geographically a part of Piemonte, not administratively and in Valtellina which is part of Lombardy. Any of these subregion uh, has its own clone or clones. I should spend hours I could spend hours about talking how Nebbiolo is. These are dominant flavors, but it's, this chart is a bit reductive, okay? Because also with the climate change, many things in terms of terpenes are changing. So these are the dominant flavors that we have in uh, fresher vintages today. But in uh, warmer wind vintages, uh, the wines are transforming themselves uh, with, uh, with more Rodanian profiles, uh, more heat and different terpenes, basically. And then we arrive to the heart of Nebbiolo, we arrive to the heart of Piemonte, we arrive to the, to the, the heart of luxury, of wine, luxury wines in Italy. 
the subregions of Barolo and Barbaresco. Subregions of Barolo and Barbaresco are part of a larger system called Lange, which is part of a no, or even more larger system, which is Piemonte. So if we can see we have Piemonte, we have the subregion of Lange, and we have the sub subregions of Barolo and Barbaresco. Barolo and Barbaresco are both located uh, around Alba, the famous city for truffle and torrone, and hazelnuts, of course, the most famous and most expensive hazelnuts in the world. And Barolo is southwards Alba, Barbaresco in northwards uh, Alba. The two regions are different. We have uh, two different geologies, mainly it's both ancient seabeds, uh, and we already have the experience that seabeds are possibly uh, the best soils for wine or specifically for high qualitative, uh, high end wines. But the Barolo area it's mainly divided in, in uh, sandy mars of two types blue mars where uh, and uh, red mars blue uh, mars rich in zinc and copper and red mars uh, mouse rich in iron and then we have the part of Baresco which is still sandy rich in uh, white mars uh, so the differences between Barbaro Barolo Barbaresco and not only due to the differences of aging or uh, refinement of the, uh, the, two diff the two different wines, it's also due to a slight difference in soils and, of course, climate, where the climate in Barbaresco is fresher and the climate in the Barolo area, then depending also on the, uh, on the village, are, and the altitude are, of course, uh, warmer with, with stronger influence uh, of the Ligurian winds. And this exactly uh, in terms of aging we have these differences uh, with Barolo and Barbaresco. These are the three main clones used for Barolo and Barbaresco, the minimum aging for Barolo and the minimum aging for Barbaresco. But then again let's focus not only on that, let's focus also on the differences in soil and microclimates. Just to give you an example, this is a picture taken in, uh, in Lange, the Lange viticultural landscape looks like that. Very straight, very ordered, uh, very well organized. This is the mentality of the area. And this is also what you see from the Lange area. So when we say that Piemonte is uh, uh, is 40, more than 40% mountains, that's what you can see from the Lange area. The background, you have a mountain which is not the highest in Piemonte, which is 3,841 meters. And actually, Piemonte uh, means at the foot of the mountains. And it refers actually at the western part of, uh, uh, of Turin, as I said, the cradle of the House of Savoy. So this valley was part of the County of Savoy uh, since the early 11th century, so 1040. And this part of their county was called Piemonte, Piedmont, because it was at the foot of the Monsigny Pass. So Monsigny Pass is 2,000 meters, surrounded by 3,700 meters mountains, and it was one of the main passes controlled in the Middle Ages, as we said before, for the passage of people and armies. Which are the other important Subregions in Piemonte. In the uh, close to the Lange area, we have Roero. We have to, to remember that Lange and Roero are UNESCO areas. The vineyards of the whole area is protected by the UNESCO heritage. And Roero is different from Barolo and Barbaresco because we have more sandy soils uh, that uh, create. Nebbiolos that are uh, readier to drink when younger in comparison with Barolo, first of all, and Barbaresco. And also is the area, famous area for Arnais. But we also have uh, uh, Moscato, some Moscato here. It's not relevant, but we, it's cultivated here. And then the other important part of Piemonte is Monferrato, uh, divided in uh, mainly four parts. Uh, and this is also important relevant with history because Monferrato uh, became part 
of Piemont as we see today in the late 17th century. Uh, actually for uh, several centuries it was the was the uh, um, uh, the March of Monferrato was housed to one of the most important imperial Byzantine families, the House of Palaiologos, that moved to uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, and went to Piemont through uh, marriage. So uh, eventually, uh, some member of the Palaiologos families married a person of the uh, ruling family of Monferrat. Therefore, the Casale Alba were part uh, of uh, a state that was independent as well for several centuries and became part of the Duce of Savoy only in the 17th century. This also created another area which is culturally different, still in part of Piemonte, but has other expressions. And also is an area in which we start, can start to find uh, grapes that are more Italian, like Vermentino, uh, like Cortese, especially in the southern part of this Monferrato area. But it's also the area of the famous Moscato d'Asti. And then we have another area that still is relatively unknown, but it's extremely good, extremely important, and close to the, uh, to the Monte Rosa mountains, as we see before mainly cultivated with uh, uh, Nebbiolo, in this case the clone Spanna, and Erbaluce, or called Greco, because it seems that this gra grape variety called Greco Novarese, so Greek from Novara, was actually brought uh, in the ancient time from Greece into Piemonte, but it's, it's still uh, in discussion, this topic, but that's what the uh, uh, we, what it's always told about this grape. This area is extremely important because it makes Nebbiolo of extreme longevity and, uh, and great finesse. And actually from Lesona, the, the wine that was used for celebrating, uh, comes the wine that was used for celebrating the Italian unification in 1860. Lesona from Tenute Sella. What else is famous Piemonte for cheese. We have at least 60 different sorts. The Nocciola Tonde Gentile, which is possibly the most important uh, hazelnut in the world for pastry, very expensive. The White Truffle Alba, uh, which I, I represent here in Austria as uh, institution, not commercially, but this institution as the master of the order of the Knights of Alba, or, so the Knights of the Truffle and the Wines of Alba. Chocolate. Chocolate, nobody is really talking about it, but the birthplace of modern chocolate is Turin. The, the legend is that in 1563, the Duke Emmanuel Philibert, which was the head of the, um, the general, in, uh, head general of the Habsburg, Habsburg armies, won the Italian wars for Philip II of Habsburg. And uh, by the time Spain was importing cocoa beans uh, in Europe, and uh, the, the, king, the emperor gave the possibility to uh, the Duke Emmanuel Philibert of Savoy, de Savoy, Emmanuel Philibert de Savoy, to bring, to import uh, cocoa beans in, in its duchy. And when the duchy moved the capital from Chambéry to Turin in 1563, in order to thank the new town, for its warm welcome, it offered the town a cup of hot chocolate, which was by the time even more expensive than gold. And that's when the tradition of solid chocolate started in, in Europe. Just to make you an example, during the, uh, the Napoleon Wars, uh, Swiss were coming to, to Turin to learn how to make chocolate, and the, frame, the famous François Cayet, who created the, the milk chocolate, worked as an apprentice three years in Turin. We have important pastry due to the court of the House of Savoy, cuisine, vermouth, is the birthplace of vermouth, Martini, Cinzano, Carpano, coffee, Lavazza, Vergnano, very famous for that, Lavazza, everyone knows it, the Bialetti, Mocha, today it's, we use mainly machines, I still use home the Mocha, and then the risotto rice. But the other things that are very Piemonte is very famous for is Juventus, of course, 
Uh, eh, I'm, it's my team, 500, in the sense that Fiat, is, it was the, the uh, Turin is known to be uh, one of the pillars of automotive industries in the world, but also of design, because you can think that many Ferrari that we can we are dreaming of were designed in Turin by Pininfarina. So they have the Ferrari supercar, super engine, etc. But the design was made in Turin. Uh, like for instance, I'll make you a simple example. Golf, the first Golf was designed by uh, a person from Piemonte called Giugiaro, the Bialetti, and then the Martini. So I, maybe I was a bit too long, but I can tell you that I was really short. Uh, I uh, told you in 20 minutes approximately uh, what is Piemonte and uh, I, uh, I'm, I thank you for listening to this and I please ask you to uh, take consideration what I'm saying is that if you want to understand Piemonte and its wines you have to understand the whole culture uh, because it's very complex but that makes the beauty of it.